am I am I frozen now? No, right now you're good. Yeah, we're on. We did it. All right. Hey, you doing, Philippe? My buddy, my Sunday night friend. What's happening? Good, man. How are you? I'm really How's well. Everything going? It's really well. Really well. I had a great week. I'm looking for. I always look forward to our discussions. This is turning into a pretty regular thing. I like how we're just kind of flowing with it. Kind of our intention to talk about the brain and have an average guy, me, talk to the neurologist and ask basic questions about the brain. I think we're doing a pretty good job. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think it, it, it's a lot of fun. I think uh, you get me to think about things in a completely different way. Yeah. So that's always, always really good. And, and whoever gets to listen to this, I'm sure that they're, they're learning a lot. So that's really great too. Right. And as we kick off, tell me again where, like if people have seen the first two or where do they go to find you? And are you open to, do, are you doing coaching or like, or do you do, like, can I coach with you or how does, like, do I have to have, we're going to talk about brain trauma. So do you only work with um, people that have uh, brain injuries or are you able to work with people on, for coaching and things like that? Like everyday folks? Yeah. So, so first of all, people can find me either at my Instagram at philippe.md. So okay. P-H-I-L-I-P-P-E.md. Okay. They can find me at my website, www.inle, um, brainfitinstitute.com. Okay. And, uh, you know, I work with anybody who's got a brain. Right? So, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> right? hmm, that. That's like the greatest I mean, total addressable you know, market whether, ever. Whether there's dysfunction going there or not, your brain, everything about you has to do with your brain. Yeah. I, I'd love and if you learn how your brain functions and you learn how to influence your brain and essentially learn how to take charge of your brain, your life completely, completely changes. Yeah, you've said that a lot. You've said this like uh, almost like an army, take charge of your brain, like you can, otherwise it's driving you. So you should be taking control of it or something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, I, I often say that the brain is like a two-year-old child, you know, like it'll throw tantrums, <laughs> it'll take you down a really, really dark path. Right. Like you ever notice like if, if one person pisses you off, then all of a sudden, not only are you mad at that person, you're mad at yourself. You see everything that's wrong in the world, and yep. the world just sucks. Yes, yes, <laughs> right? yes. And that's your brain just being out of control. Yeah. Like it just latches onto one negative thought, one negative experience. Right. And it starts to focus on everything negative. Great. So and you have the ability to control what you think, yeah. how you act, what you teach your brain. Um, so essentially, how you lead it. Yeah. And your brain desperately needs you to be to be a leader. I, I like I like that you're talking about leadership, and I just want to point out that I'm being led around by a two year old brain. So thank you for that. Now I feel very happy yeah. about myself. It's okay. We all are. It's we a, all have our moments. Um, let me let's jump in. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about um, brain trauma. I definitely have my own story about a, a brain injury when I was younger, but I, I want to just we'll come back to that. If you could just put us in the world of what is a brain trauma? Like, what does that mean? Is that a con does that include concussions from soccer or football? Or how do you define it? Are there different grades? If you could just get us in that world, that would be super helpful. Yeah, so, you know, a brain trauma is anything that's going to cause dysfunction to your brain, anything that's going to cause your neurons to not function properly. Um, and so that can certainly be physical trauma, which is what we often think about. So that can be a concussion uh, another type of head injury that can be a stroke, right? Because that actually causes the breakdown of, of brain tissue. Mm. Um, but that can also be substances that cause trauma to our brain. That, that can be medications. I was, mm. uh, before we started a few hours ago, somebody called me because their family members started a medication and they were now acting really funny. Right. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's the medication that is doing that, right? Mm. Um, so anything that's going to cause some, some, uh, dysfunction in your brain is a brain trauma. Okay. Okay. And then are there different grades? Like as a, as a neurologist, do you say I deal with all brain traumas or you're, are you a specialist and you only deal in brain trauma in this insert area and that's your specialty? Yeah. So, you know, different neurologists will, will deal with different things. So some neurologists, so we all have training in everything. Okay. But then people really start to specialize, right, or subspecialize. Um, and so some people will say, look, I only deal in my subspecialty. Some people will say, look, it's, it's, it's the brain. So if it's impacting the brain, I, I've, I've sort of got it, right? Right. Um, but, 
you know, we, we try to grade these things. We do try to, even concussions try to get graded. Um, oh, it's right there. This grades, stuff yeah. is always in flux. It's always changing. Yeah. But certainly there's a difference between if somebody, you know, hits their head and develops a headache versus they hit their head and they, pa they pass out. One, you know, the latter is more serious than the first one. Got it. Right. Got it. Um, if somebody um, has a gunshot wound in the brain, that's Whoa. a very different thing going on. Okay. Right. So, yeah. so certainly different kinds of traumas are, you know, they, they call for different needs. People have different needs what, as a result. What's the, you just mentioned a, a, a gunshot to the brain. Um, what, what's like, what's one of the more, most severe brain traumas that you've, that you've worked with, uh, that you've had to uh, help someone to kind of oh, I've work seen, through? Uh, or yeah, what have you seen? Yeah. Yeah, look, I've seen people who, who are walking around with bullet fragments in their brain, right? Wow. <laughs> and they're still doing okay. Yeah. Um, I've seen people suffer significant injuries from, from car accidents, from flipping over um, uh, ATVs. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen people, you know, obviously people with strokes, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, like we said, that's another brain injury. Uh, so all types of, all types of injuries, people who... Um, have ruptured aneurysms as a result. Um, so yeah, so so brain injuries can look like a lot of different things. What what does a ruptured aneurysm mean? And like, like what's actually happening? Because <clears throat> I feel like I've heard that. And if you asked yeah. me on a test, I'd be like, uh, yeah, uh, ruptured aneurysm uh, for the win. But I would have no. Yeah. I I don't know if I'd know how to explain that. I know I wouldn't. Yeah. So think about your your blood vessels like a tube, right? That the blood yeah. is flowing through. And then when you have an aneurysm, there's a part of the blood vessel where it starts to balloon out a little bit. Okay. Right? And so when that essentially ruptures or starts to leak, all that blood then goes into the brain. Oh. It ca can cause significant damage. Can even um, that can certainly kill somebody. So th you're talking about like when you say like my brain is bleeding or I feel like my brain that is actually a thing. Well, people can certainly have brain bleeds for different reasons so an right. aneurysm is one of them yeah um really high blood pressure can cause your brain to bleed so that's another reason yeah sometimes people deposit little protein particles throughout their brains and that makes it more likely that their brain will bleed mm -hmm. um somebody who's on a blood thinner that can potentially cause bleeding in the brain yeah so there are reasons why people can develop bleeding got it and then so You've had a trauma. Do, does as a neurologist, do you get into the? Um, you've seen a trauma. You saw someone with uh, bleeding in their brain or an injury. Do you get involved with the? Here's your plan for the next year, two years, or is that someone else's job? Or do you work with that other person? Or how, how does that work? Now that I, I've had a tra traumatic brain injury, I now need a year or two years of you know something. I mean, how do you, it's, is it like a diet plan? Is it that simple? Like 50 push-ups <laughs> here, you know what I mean? Like what is it, what does a, a brain trauma rehabilitation program look like? Well, everybody needs different things, right? So right. two people can have bleeding in the brain or, you know, some kind of trauma in the brain and have completely different manifestations of that, mm -hmm. have completely different symptoms, mm -hmm. different degrees of the, the brain injury. And so you really want to try to tailor um, what the plan is going to be. Mm. And you've got to get to what the underlying cause is. What is it that caused this person to bleed or, or to develop this trauma to begin with? Because you really want to, to, to handle that. Mm. Um, and oftentimes, depending on the trauma, it's not just the neurologist, but it's the neurologist, the neurosurgeon. You know, they come through an ER, so the ER team, uh, the primary care doctors, uh, you know, depends on what their other medical problems are. Yeah. Then you're looking at potentially physical therapists, occupational therapists, wow. cognitive rehab, wow. speech therapists. Right. So it, it depends. It becomes a, a, a massive team approach to help somebody when it comes to, you know, some kind of injury to the brain. And are the most common, what's the most common brain, when, when somebody says brain injury, like, I don't know, I'm making it up, when if somebody says broken bone, I would imagine somewhere somebody would say, ah, it's broken wrist. That's the most common one because yeah. <laughs> ki kids are running around on their bikes or something. Like, so what's the most yeah. common that you see in, when someone says brain trauma or brain injury, what is, what's the most common? What's like something that is 
garden well, variety? Well, I think it depends. It, it, it depends on that person, right? So yeah. in somebody who has high blood pressure, really high blood pressure, then it could be bleeding as a result of the high blood pressure, right? right? If you're looking at a 20-year-old kid who you know takes a whole bunch of risk, it might be um, a traumatic brain injury from a car accident. So yeah. it really depends on, on who that person is. I love I love the neurology training here on it. Really depends. I, I would be like, eh, it's this broken wrist. It's, it's the leg. <laughs> I guess you've just seen so much. You've seen so many different things, and no case is ever the same. It's like being an inspector or something. Yeah. Right. So so like I said, people can come in, and you can say, yeah, this person has a stroke, and that person has a stroke, but they present very very differently. differently. They've got different needs, and so you've got to come up with different different strategies for them, different plans. It's a different reason that they, they both had that stroke. Yeah. And um, so you want to individualize it as much as possible. And how do you, what are the tools? Now, I remember there used to be CAT scans, then MRIs. Now you're, we're doing like, we're taking skulls out and injecting fluids. I mean, what are some of the tools to be able to diagnose these brain injuries? Uh, how, what, are, what are some of your tools that you yeah. would go so to? So usually somebody coming in, in through the emergency room, they'll always get a CAT scan because it's really fast. Right away. Right? So you get it done like, you know, you, you get that thing done within like two minutes and essentially the images are coming right up while the person's still sort of on the table. Okay. And so you're able to get a really good sense of what's going on. And then based on what that CAT scan shows, then you're going to decide. And, and based on how the person is doing, then you'll decide what other things that that person may need. Right? And what, what is the CAT scan showing? Like, is it, is it the, the blueprint? Is it like, because then what's the difference between the CAT scan and the MRI? And then, the, you know what I mean? Like, what is the CAT scan yeah. giving you the base level of actually? So the CAT scan is showing you a pretty good picture of the brain. Okay. A really fast, really good picture of the brain. Right? Snapshot, not movement, yeah. just a snapshot. Like a income statement or something like that, like a, just, yeah, it, yeah. And, it, and it'll show you different, different layers of the brain. Okay. Right? Really quick, but it doesn't show you the details of the brain as well as an MRI does. Hmm. But if somebody's coming in and they potentially have bleeding in the brain in that moment, I don't really care about the MRI. I don't really care about the details. I want to know one, are they bleeding in the brain? How big is this, this blood? Because now I need to know you know, do the do we need to take this person to the operating room and have the neurosurgeons do something? Wow. Um, whether it is take off the skull or, or potentially if it's an aneurysm, do they need to clip that aneurysm? So so the CAT scan can give you a lot of valuable information really, really quickly, right? Yeah. And again, depending on how somebody presents it. Let's say somebody comes in, all of a sudden they have a seizure for the first time, right? And so you're going to take them into the CAT scan right away because you're like, well, this is not somebody who, with a history of seizures. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure there's nothing new going on that's causing them to have seizures. That could be, look, they just had a stroke and that dysfunction is causing their brain to have these bursts of electrical activity, which is causing the seizure. Could be they're bleeding into their brain. Could be they have an infection in their brain mm -hmm. right? Um, that's causing uh, their, their neurons to misfire and, and causing the seizures. Yeah. So again, it gives you a lot of really useful information so that way you can then decide what you're going to do next. And so when you do all that, I just thought of this, like you do this up front, say something needs to happen, you need to go like fill in the, neuro the um, neurosurgeon on what needs to happen on some level. So there's a whole download well, that has to happen to the neurosurgeon, right? I mean, you have to, you're, be, you're diagnosing and... Eh? Yeah, and, and depending on why the person's coming in, mm -hmm. look, the ER may call everybody, right? The ER may have a protocol where it's like they call the neurologist and neurosurgeon to be right, there. Right, right. Um, and so a lot of times these conversations are happening together as a team. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and everybody sort of puts in their two cents as to what's going to be the best thing to do for that person. Interesting. Interesting. I'm thinking, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you now about my my brain abscess that we didn't know was an abscess, no. right? So this is 19, oh, uh, thunder. It was like very ominous. I just said that and like thunder, <laughs> thunder happened. Like I meant to do it, like, yes. Um, so 1984, I'm eight years old. I had a car accident when I was five years old and um, I basically broke my jaw. Long story short, I wasn't driving at five, just to let everybody know. Um, and I broke my jaw and basically, Three years later, I like fainted 
in a water fountain at school, and I um, I started having a seizure. I, I, I'm not determined it on like is if it was uh, an epileptic seizure or a seizure where I think I was like staring maybe straight ahead. So I'm not quite sure. I have to double check with my mother, but um, I went to the uh, ER again, 84. Really, I don't think MRIs. So it was like mostly CAT scans. I get in. Um, they say, um, you have an inoperable brain tumor. You have like three months to live and everybody's like, what the, f you know, people go crazy. So they, that's what they thought. And you know, the, it was a bunch of, bunch of doctors in the room and one doctor stood up. I, the, actually the only female doctor in the room, Madeline Olson stood up and said, I think it might be an abscess. Can we work with him for the next few months? And if it shrinks, will know and let me work, we'll, we'll do an experimental drug called Dilantin. Um, so I was in this. I think you're, you're definitely aging yourself right now. That's fine. That's Dilantin fine. Dilantin was experimental. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Dilantin was experimental <laughs> back in 1984 when I was, when I was eight. Yeah. It's, it's fine. I, I am, I am my age, Philippe. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so then we did that. And like, uh, as the story goes, the night, so I, I did that. I was on like the chronically ill kids ward for you know three to three to four months and the night before i was expected to go to texas to have a inoperable brain you know uh, surgery where i there was a couple of choices it would have been very bad for me even if they succeed i don't they don't know if i would get function back um it shrunk by like the smallest amount and so they say okay i think it might be an abscess keep him here i don't go to surgery never have surgery and then basically it shrinks and like a month later it's gone and so that's the story. And then for the next two years, I go in once a month to get tests and everything. But for those three months, I mean, from a seizure to a, an abscess. So can you just tell, what, what is an abscess? What is, what is, when somebody says I have an abscess in my brain, how is that different than anything else? How could it be, sh how can it shrink with Dilantin? Um, like, what does that mean to shrink an abscess versus having surgery? In my case, like, why didn't I need surgery? Yeah, so what an abscess is, it's, it's like it's an infection, right? Okay. But the infection is very well encapsulated. So it's in one particular area. And I'm sure if we were to go back and look at your records, you probably were not just only on Dilantin because oh, Dilantin I'm is sure. an anti-seizure medication. Okay. Right? And so they gave you the Dilantin because you had a seizure. And then when they did the CAT scan, they were like, oh, there's something there. So there's a reason for him. Um, to have a seizure, and he's at risk for more seizures. So let's put him on on Dilantin, which is an anti seizure medication. Can we can we talk about before you jump forward? What is a seizure? What happens during a seizure? I know that this is your specialty, right? So can you just break yeah. down like what is a seizure? I mean, I, I think yeah. we've seen it in movies, or you've seen it maybe happen where it's either I'm completely stiff or I'm you know more violently shaking. So what's happening? Yeah. So the way that the cells in the brain communicate is through electricity. Okay. And so when somebody has a seizure, there's a burst of electrical activity in the brain, almost like a short circuit, hmm. right? And so depending, seizures can look like a lot of different things. So people often think it's like somebody falls to the ground and they have these big movements of their extremities. Yes. And that is one, one type of, of seizure. We call that a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. But depending on what part of the brain is involved, a seizure could look like anything. Hmm. There's a, somebody I used to take care of where her, her seizures were like a running movie of her life because her seizures would only occur in her occipital lobe, which is responsible for vision. And so whenever she had a seizure, she would just see like sort of like a running movie of wow, her life. Wow, right? wow, wow. Or there was um, someone who uh, I used to take care of where the first time he had a seizure, he was at a Knicks game. Mm -hmm. And the Knicks must have done something really, really good. So you know this is decades ago, right? I was going to say, I, <laughs> I was going to say, what are you talking about the Knicks doing something good? That was the seizure. Yeah, He's like, I so, can't believe it. Yeah, and so, you know, he, everybody stood up to clap. And so he stood up to clap. But when everybody sat back down, he kept, he kept clapping. That was his seizure. And do, did he, right? did he see and it then, happening? Could, could he get out of it? Could he go, why can't I stop clapping? Was he aware of it or no? No. And he wow. was, he was sort of out of it. And wow. every time he had a seizure, he would stand up and clap. Oh my God. Right? So yeah. depending on what part of the brain is involved, that's what your seizure looks like. But essentially 
what's going on in the brain is you get a burst of electrical activity in the brain, Mm -hmm. almost like a short circuit. And a seizure is always sort of a a symbol of something wrong occurring in the brain, Hmm. whether it's something that we can see when we do a CAT scan or an MRI, or there's some dysfunction in the neurons itself. Something is causing the neurons to misfire. Hmm. Got it. Okay. Got it. Sorry to cut you off um, on that, but you were saying that it couldn't be just dilantin. It was had to be a right. cocktail, but thank you for that digression to seizures. Appreciate it. Yeah. No, and so they probably also put you on some antibiotics I, if I, they I, were suspecting that you were think so. had an abscess. I think so. Right? Yeah. And so, yeah, so they, they saw that you had an abscess, which is a an infection that's really well encapsulated. Right. And they were like, let's put him on some antibiotics and see if it shrinks. Got it. And then, so that's the abscess. You know, you'll hear, because they thought it was a tumor. So then what is the yeah. difference between, like, a, a abscess versus tumor? When somebody says, you know, un- unfortunately, you've heard, right, people that have a brain tumor. What is What actually is going yeah. on during a, a brain tumor as opposed to either an abscess or anything else? And why, yeah, is, so it, why is it so challenging? A, yeah. So a brain tumor is a collection of cells. It's an overgrowth of cells, right? And okay. certainly on a CAT scan, sometimes a tumor can sort of look like an abscess mm. Um, mm. in terms that you've got this sort of uh, thing there that's not supposed to be there. It could be round or ovoid. There could be a lot of swelling around it. Um, and it's, especially if you're using just a CAT scan, it may be tough right, right. to figure it out. But all of the, there's some things that you can use to potentially distinguish the two. Um, certainly now with MRIs, people don't really have any issue distinguishing a, a, an abscess from a brain tumor. Yeah. But, you know, they can kind of look the same. And so uh, you said the doctor who, who suspected it was an abscess, Dr. Madeline. Madeline Olson. Madeline, if you're around and still she, around, she, I've, I've tried to find her. On. I've tried to find her. It's impossible so far. Yeah. Off the radar. She, she, was, spot, she was spot on. Yeah. You know, so she, she did... Um, she did great work. She, she, she figured it out. And not only did she figure it out, but she also um, sort of led you down a path that wasn't going to put you at, at, at risk. further risk by yeah. doing brain surgery that you didn't need. Let me, let me ask you, you just mentioned stuff. She figured it out. Like, I ha- actually just thought of this. Do you feel like you're a little bit of a detective um, when you're doing your work? I mean, what, and, and if so... What's a case that you really had a tough time cracking and maybe just walk us through like what was it? What's the case of the uh, that, that you really were like I couldn't figure it out what was happening? What's the function? How do we get here? What do I need yeah. to do stuff like that? Fascinating. Yeah, you, so so medicine in general, right? You're supposed to be able to 90% of the time you should figure out the person's diagnosis just by the story that they tell you and the exam mm. like you shouldn't need like blood tests. You shouldn't need um, all these fancy imaging. You should all you need to do is really listen to their story, mm. examine them, and ninety percent of the time that should give you your your diagnosis. That's even more so for the neurological exam. Mm. You should be able to listen to their story, figure out what's going on, mm. and figure out what part of the brain or the what part of your nervous system is being affected. Wow. Right? And so, in, in that's, neurology, that's not that's not that. what I that's not what I thought neurologists did at all. I thought it was like all like just tools and you know. Yeah, and so and, and medicine has evolved, right? Mm. Because look, I mean, the reality is like um, you can make a lot more money if you're doing MRIs and all these fancy understood. tests. Understood, understood, understood. Right. Um, but yeah, but no, you're supposed to just be able to listen to a story, examine somebody, and tell you. Not only what's going on, but what part of their brain, spinal cord, or nerves is being affected. And we call that in neurology, localization. You, you're supposed to be able to localize the lesion, say exactly where the issue is. Okay. And so when you're training yeah. in neurology, that's what a lot of it is. It's really about learning how to localize and figure out where there's dysfunction in the nervous system. Um, mm. And so that that takes a lot of time, and there's certainly yeah, tough moments now where where you have trouble figuring these things out. Yeah, where you're not sure. You know, I think there's supposed to be an art to medicine, and certainly there's supposed to be an art uh, to neurology. Oh, you know, yeah. and, but I think that the way that we practice now, where everybody just gets scanned right off the bat, um, 
you kind of lose that art. And sometimes even when people get scanned, right, their, their scans come back completely fine. Right. And then people are like, well, the MRI is normal, so the person's faking it. <laughs> it's like, well, that's, right. that's not true. That's not true. What's the, what's the like, just follow up here. What's the most curious case? What's, what, you could have figured it out. Maybe it didn't stump you, but you're like, like I, that story of clapping to me is incredible. Well, what's something else where yeah. you like solved the case or you saw somebody come in that you're like, this was a little bit interesting or this was a little bit out of the ordinary? Oh, my gosh. Um, or, just, or just one that you remember that you're like one that really touched you or moved you or something along those lines. One that, let's see. You know, it, it, I'm sure plenty will come to me in a little bit. So I'm, yeah. trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to think... Uh, Listen, we, look, we have people sometimes where all of a sudden they don't recognize their family members. Right. And they recognize the faces. So they'll be like, yeah, that person looks like Adam, but right. that person is not Adam because um, they've lost the emotional connection to that person. Yeah. And that'll be because of a lesion in their brain, mm -hmm. um, especially in sort of the frontal lobes of their brain that can occur because of uh, things like dementia or even some, some mental health issues. But that's one thing that comes to mind. I mean, yeah. we, not so long ago, somebody came to me and they were like, I'm having um, uh, some pain on the tip of my penis. And I'm like, are you sure you want to see neurology or urology? Yeah, uh, the, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And what happened? What did they say? And they were like, well, nobody, nobody can figure out what's going on. And when nobody can figure out what's going on with somebody, they always send them to the neurologist because they're like, you know, we can't figure it out. It's got to be something neurological. Right. And oftentimes it is, right? And because you have nerves that are going to every area it's of the body. It's all coming back, right. And so, and this guy, um, the reason he was having the issues he was having was because he had a little bit of a herniated disc that was pushing on the nerve that was supplying his penis. So, okay, so that's a good question. So if you said the tip of my penis is feeling X, Y, Z, you literally yeah. can trace it back to the, well, where's the source? Where does it start the flow or where? Lower, lower, like the lower back, yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. I mean, at first, I'm kind of like, dude, you need to get tested for an STD. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> well, let's assume that that comes back fine. It's like, all right, well, let's, let's figure this out. <laughs> Good to know. Urology and neurology working together since 2020, right. whatever that was. But most of the time, people confuse us and we're like, listen, you know, essentially the wrong head. Right? That's so funny. That's funny. That's really funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was I going to say? <laughs> One more, I, I just came up. So in college, I had, you, you mentioned the, like a little, something a little bit out of the ordinary. In college, I basically had this thing where I, star, I started vomiting <clears throat> and I went blind, mm -hmm. almost like blind or blank. Like I couldn't really see, it was all fuzzy. And I, I walked into the emergency room, my friend drove me. And the, I remember specifically the woman asking me like, who I like, what was my social security number? And I kind of saw it in my head and I went to say what the number was. And I went mm, like, I couldn't, it didn't connect from my brain to like speech. And I would say people probably have a lot of these things in their lives at some point where, Oh my God, I felt like I was trapped in my own body. I couldn't speak or something like what's happening yeah. there. Maybe you don't have a brain trauma but a little interrupt happens and you're like, that was so strange. For one day, I couldn't feel my whatever. Or for one day, I, I couldn't speak. I, I, or I forgot my name for a day or some, something random like that. What's happening there? Yeah, look, people have transient episodes of amnesia. Transient often. episodes. Yeah, that's something, right? Okay. Right? And sometimes we call it like transient global amnesia. Okay. And so where all of a sudden they will not have any memory for the last few hours. And, um, and there's all types of different theories as to why this can happen from like, well, maybe there's a, a change in circulation, especially towards the back part of the brain. But I remember the, the first few times that I saw this, right, mm. where all of a sudden, uh, and, and, and these particular people were all men, uh, all of a sudden, like, these men were just like losing 
uh, their memory of the last few hours of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so the first few times I saw this, they were all in middle-aged men and were all in middle-aged men who were sleeping with women that were significantly younger than them. And okay. these were happening during moments of sexual activity. So, right? okay, and so, okay. And so, you know, so like I said, there are all types of theories as to why th things like this can happen, but right, anything right. can throw your nervous system off, right? So if somebody's vomiting, like you said you were, yeah. or maybe when you were bearing down, you're increasing the pressure in your head. Maybe you're decreasing the blood flow to your brain. Um, Interesting. And that's, Interesting. that was causing some neurological dysfunction there. Maybe uh, because you were vomiting and you were maybe vomiting so much like, I don't know, potassium or chloride or whatever it is, yeah. that, um, you know, having that dysfunction in, in, in those ions was causing some dysfunction in your brain. Yeah. So I'll tell you, and this is, um, I think this is a good one to, to close on this little story and this little anecdote. They thought it might have been meningitis or something. So like, yeah. and then, then they basically took a spinal tap, which hurt. Yeah. And then my brain basically went down in the fluid. Then they needed to take a blood patch and do another spinal tap to raise it back up. So like, can you, just, yeah. what, what is, what does spinal meningitis do? What does brain, yeah. like, what is your brain sitting in brain fluid wise? Like, is it that temperamental that like, Oh, I forgot to turn off the spigot and my brain is resting on less <laughs> fluid. Like I forgot to fill up my car tires uh, for the winter. Um, like, what, yeah. Just those two things, I think, is a really interesting part to, to talk about. Yeah, so when people develop meningitis, it's because the meninges, yeah. the coverings of the brain, get infected. Okay. And so when you're checking somebody for meningitis, what you can do is you can do a spinal tap like you mentioned. So all of us, our, our brains are bathed in fluid. They surround the brain. Uh, there are parts of the brain called a ventricle that has a lot of fluid. They bathe the entire spinal cord. And so you want to essentially test that fluid to see if there's an infection there. Hmm. Right? So the, the only way that you can really get to that fluid is by doing a spinal tap. So you put a needle below the level of the spinal cord. So you actually go below Whoa. where the spinal cord ends. right? And you punch through with that needle. You actually punch through the layers that cover like your brain, your spinal cord, and some of the nerves, right? Mm. So you punch through that. You make a little hole there, right? Yeah. The needle is really, really tiny. And so in theory, you're making a really small hole. But oftentimes, what happens is if, if you're just doing it without using like an x-ray, if you're just doing it at the bedside, it might be hard to find exactly where you need to go oh. to be able to access that fluid. Oh, I'm having memories. Right? I'm having flashbacks. And so people are kind of poking around back there. Oh. And now making a hole. <laughs> and uh, yo, are you okay? You're, I'm having, like you're about to pass out. I'm having a flashback, dude. It hurts. So that's the yeah. some of the biggest pain that I've ever been in. They like bite on this. I'm like, yeah. you give me something. Give me something else here. <laughs> bite on this. Right? What is this? So 1920. Yeah, they're making <laughs> they're making this hole a little bit bigger than it, it really should be. Right. And as a result now, even when the spinal tap is done, you're leaking some fluid out. Ugh. And so you're dropping the the pressure and as because you're dropping the pressure, your brain might now be sitting a little bit lower right. than it should because that, that fluid helps to keep your brain buoyant so it's not pushed up against the skull also. Right. Right. So now the brain is sitting a little bit lower. That can give people a lot of headaches. That's that what happened to me. Feel. That's what happened to me. I, I was yeah. had severe headaches. They're like, we have to take 20 cc's of blood out of your arm and do a blood patch and pop your brain back up. I'm like, guys, what? this is crazy time. Crazy yeah, time. So, but it works. And so what they're doing with the blood patch is that they're essentially sealing that hole. They're sealing the hole so the pressure can go back up. Hmm. Fascinating. It, what, what I just heard a lot of that, first of all, this is great. Like my mind is blown. I have like 30,000 things to research. Um, what is the um, thing with water? Do, like I seem to like swimming a lot, drinking water, obviously. Sorry, what is the what? W water, fluid. Like, uh, you know, our brain sitting oh, on fluid, right? Like our most important thing is yeah. ensconced in fluid. So 
I feel like in my life, maybe why I like swimming or something with water, the earth is 70% water. I mean, what is it about that fluid that instead of just solid world? Anything on the brain? So, what is, so, so are you asking like when people say they've got fluid on their brain, are you saying what is it about? I'm saying why, why is our brain surrounded by fluid? I mean, I mean uh, I, maybe, my well, whole, maybe my whole body is and I don't know it, but... Yeah, I mean, your, your body is like more than 60% fluid. That's incredible. Your entire body is. I don't know if you your even brain, know if I know. Your brain is the same thing. Huh. Yeah. I'm coming off really <laughs> smart. I'm coming off so smart in this episode. People are going to be like, he didn't know? <laughs> listen, 60% of yeah, your listen. body was fluid? I mean, yeah. yeah. Our cells are filled with fluid, hmm. right? Uh, you know, like, look, you, if you hurt yourself... And, and you get some swelling, a lot of that is fluid. That's why I didn't go to medical school, man. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. All right. Um, let's sign off. Anything else yep. to say um, today on, uh, about trauma and the brain or things we should be doing for everyday mental and, and brain fitness? Well, definitely try not to hurt your brain. That's true. Because <laughs> that will, you know, impact every aspect of you. It's not just the physical, it's the emotional, it's the mental. Right. And while things can heal and recover, sometimes, right, it's like if you break a bone, you know, in your arm, well, maybe your arm is never the same afterwards. And for some yeah, people, yeah. They, they, they experience that. You know, they have an injury to their brain, and maybe physically they look like they recover, but but inside they feel like they're never quite the same afterwards. Yeah, and so it. you want to do everything that you can to protect your brain. But if you do injure your brain, the great thing is that your brain is capable of a tremendous amount of healing Yeah, as long as you're doing what you need to do to, to sort of kick off and continue that healing process. That sounds like a future episode of, you know, talking about things that we do to make our brains at the most optimal, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we're going to do that. Okay, Philippe? Have a great night. We made it this time through without the, the video pausing. So that's good stuff. Oh, uh, now, now you're freezing when you say that. <laughs> no, did I really? Oh, God. All right, I'm going to end it. We'll see you soon. I'll see you next week, everybody. All right. See you guys. Bye.